Hello and uh, welcome back. We are now uh, at the last phase, last part of the course. We have reached module 8. So far we have looked at various um, aspects of bilingualism uh, in all its nuances and now in this part, in this last module, 8th module, we will look at the, we will kind of um, take stock of, of the all the developments that have taken place, all we have looked at in a nutshell, in a summarized form. Also in this, in this module, we will uh, try and see uh, the trend that is, um, that is following from here, that the new trends, the new domains of research that, ha that this discipline has given rise to and where things are moving. That is what this module will uh, look at. So, let us get started. First part of this module, we will focus on the new trends, new trends as in new research trends uh, in bilingualism. So, uh, starting with uh, when we looked at the course in the very beginning, we looked at the social aspects. If you remember, we started with uh, language contact and how languages come into, how one community moves into another and languages come, in, come in, uh, in touch and as a result of which many things happen, bilingualism is one of them. So, we started with the social and socio-cultural background uh, in a historical setting, we looked at all of these pointers. And then from there onward, we looked at bilingualism in all its various uh, aspects. So, various uh, avatars, let us say. So, starting from the social and uh, then gradually we moved on to the cognitive aspect of bilingualism because we know, we saw that bilingualism of course is a social phenomena, but it does not remain only out there, out there in the uh, society so to say. So, when we say that a society as a whole is bilingual, what it means is that more often than not, the individuals within that society are also bilingual. We also looked at the possibilities of social bilingualism and individual bilingualism and their interaction. So, individual bilinguals may or may not be part of a socially bilingual setup, whereas social bilingualism more often than not entails individual bilingualism. So, all of these are, uh, they cannot remain only in the social domain, they also uh, make an impact, they also have, uh, they make inroads into the mental aspects of the individuals. Mental aspects, uh, by mental aspects we mean cognitive aspects. So, we looked at the various cognitive um, repercussions of being a bilingual in a, in a bilingual society, how various uh, ways of looking at the world, the world view uh, that is enshrined in a language, how language cognition um, interacts in a bilingual uh, person's mind and so on. And then also we also looked at the neural aspects of these entire processes. So, starting from the society to the mental, cognitive to the neural aspects. This is a journey we have uh, uh, undertaken till now. Now, even though till module 7 we have tried to cover as much ground as possible within the sphere of bilingualism. But like any other academic discipline, this is also not a stagnant field. This is any, any academic discipline grows all the time. Every now and then there are new or newer way of looking at things. So, that is, an, that is a hallmark of any academic discipline. So, similarly for bilingualism. So, the field is changing so rapidly, sometimes it is very difficult to keep up. So, with this background, I want to uh, give a brief overview of the research trends that is happening now. Now, when we say about trends, what we mean is trends as they are today because as I said, it is a very, very rapidly changing discipline each um, and also because not only it is rapidly changing, not only because it is like any other academic discipline, but also because which is an Im more important aspect of this discipline is that it is an interdisciplinary domain of study. So, on the one hand, it takes into account the sociological aspects of bilingualism, then you also have um, uh, inputs from cognitive sciences as well as from the neurosciences. So, any new development in either of these uh, various disciplines affects how we look at bilingualism today. So, that is why when you talk about new trends, what we mean new is what is new today. It may not remain new tomorrow. And all of these new things that we will talk about shortly also are not sudden changes. As we have seen over a period of time, how changes have been building up. So, it is a gradually evolving field. So, these changes have been 
taking shape over a period of time and this is as a result is a point on the continuum rather than a sudden uh, you know um, shift that is not shift as such there are gradual changes. So, evolutionary this is just an evolutionary stage of the ever changing uh, nature of this. So, while we look at the new trends this is just a uh, point uh, towards the future, uh, future way of looking at the discipline, future trends and the where the research is going. So, that is the uh, with that kind of a very short introduction to this module let us go ahead. So, the entire module will be divided into these two broadly uh, specified domains. One is the new developments within bilingualism research itself. So, bilingualism uh, research uh, as I just said that there are changes happening in all the uh, connected domains. So, sociological research, uh, neurosciences, cognitive sciences, so that is one. So, deeper developments in these areas have given rise to developments within bilingualism research and that is what is taking it forward to newer uh, pastures, that is one. Simultaneously, the impact of this domain has also shown its effect on the other sister domains. Sister domains as in within linguistics, within uh, language studies, there are many other domains which do not take bilingualism as a main uh, point, but they look at for, for example, first language, what happens in a bilingual society to the first language. Okay, fine, bilinguals are uh, doing this, doing that, but then uh, nobody is talking about the first language. So, that is also one another sister domain, that is what we mean by sister domain. Similarly, many other uh, such connected domains within language, uh, language sciences. So, the idea we will look at is what happens to the first language, can the findings from bilingualism be translated into third or more languages because um, this is a natural question ok. If, if this is how bilingual language acquisition happens will the same process be repeated when we learn a third language or a fourth language or what happens when you are living in a totally multilingual setup. Do we follow the same trends, do we follow the same processes, do we process those languages in the same way as the bilingual and so on. So, as a result uh, new trends in multilingualism research has also uh, been taking place and there are some new models that have been proposed. Now, we will uh, again start with again go back to bilingualism before we move on to multilingualism and others. So, there are four issues um, in the wider domain of bilingualism research that we can ultimately bring it down to four main points, the so, four main points where the changes are happening, the changes are uh, being advocated let us say. So, one issue is how bilingualism is measured. Now, uh, if you re recall in the previous modules, we have talked about the measurement of bilingualism using various kinds of methods. On the one hand, we have different kinds of questionnaires, on the other hand, we have the experimental paradigms, various uh, different types. Now, uh, and also what are the uh, various variables that are to be taken into account. So, all of these details are going undergoing a lot of change as of today, as we speak now. So, the total number of languages spoken is not just the number of languages that is that a person speaks that can predict a positive cognitive effect that is one thing. So, bilingual measuring bilingualism is not only about measuring how many languages and when the second language was learned. However, there are many other factors like age, income, education and so many other things that have now been uh, brought to the focus. Not that they were not, uh, not uh, discussed before, but more than ever today there is a um, lot of um, discussion around these things, around these uh, variables that measuring bilingualism does not only need to be talked about in terms of age of acquisition, however many other intertwined factors, we will see some of them when we discuss them in detail. So, um, basically I, the idea today is to measure bilingualism along a series of continua, right? not just some uh, static factors over a period of time like only proficiency or only age of acquisition. How age of acquisition and proficiency interact with each other is another, another domain that, that is of interest today. So, it is not enough to say that uh, a person is high proficient bilingual or a person is an early bilingual versus a person is late bilingual. So, there are interactions even within those um, variables that is what we are uh, talking about here. Similarly, the 
another interesting idea within bilingualism research that is now uh, quite popular is the idea of the lifespan of a bilingual because throughout life a bilingual does not remain the same there are changes. So, uh, philosophically we can always say that uh, no we uh, we are completely different person today than we were 20 years back because the whole the whole thing changes the cells at the, at the cellular level things change so much so that we become a new person every few years. This is this is true in a very different way for bilingualism as well. So, bilingualism over a lifespan is another domain that is coming up in a big way and um, this is acknowledged in uh, creating uh, by creating different kinds of bilingual population and looking at them in that way. So, age of age has been of course uh, acknowledged as an important um, variable. However, once current age also matters, current age as in so you have been a bilingual for 10 years, but you are 10 year old and you have been bilingual for 10 years, but you are 60 years old are not the same thing. So, current age taking care of the lifespan of a bilingual and many other intertwined factors is another domain that is uh, now being looked at. Similarly, tasks, we have also we have discussed this task uh, related uh, controversy in the previous module as well. Um, so, carrying that idea forward, there is a lot of discussion going on today about which tasks should be used to understanding the impact of bilingualism, multilingualism on cognition because there is this idea that tasks automatically you know have an equivalent towards the processes, mental processes. So, how far the task given to the participants actually mimic the processes that goes undergoes in the bilingual's mind. This is a very subtle um, uh, nuance that is now being looked at. So, a very careful um, sometimes ecologically valid tasks also have been um, brought to focus. What do we mean by ecologically valid tasks? Often what happens in sciences uh, in that is true for any scientific domain is that there is a set of rules, there is a set of almost uh, prescribed formats, prescribed methodology through which we pass any kind of population or any kind of analysis. So, the method remains the same, population may change, the variables may change and so on. That has started getting questioned because what at our task is valid for uh, in European population may or may not be valid for uh, let us say African population or Asian population or rural versus urban population. That does it mean that as a result of which it the, we often see that there is a lack of replicability. The uh, population keeping the bilingualism age of acquisition, uh, nature of bilingualism or let us say the uh, proficiency level or you know language control all things being similar you still have a variance in the results across population when uh, between uh, European and the Asian population. So, what is happening here is not that the Asian population or the population under study from any Asian country are uh, inferior in some way or the other. It simply probably means that it is not ecologically valid. Certain tasks are too far removed from the psyche of the population that is being studied. So, those things are now getting their due share of attention. So, that is what we mean by ecologically valid tasks that are now getting created let us say or at least getting attention. So, uh, soon we will probably have culture specific or domain specific tasks that are suitable for certain populations without compromising of course, without compromising the scientific aspect of it. It is not that you cannot go too far off the mark, but taking care of all of these. So, these are very crucial matters and very nuanced and subtle things and need to be taken into account very, very carefully and work has already started on that. Similarly, uh, analysis linking language usage ma measures to experimental task performance also require a large number of different analytical tools. Now, while uh, we are at it, individual differences are often not taken into account because we need to um, have understanding of in bilinguals as a group. So, if you are a bilingual with um, you know various factors of age of acquisition, proficiency, etc., then this is how we can expect, this is what we can predict. However, a very significant thing about bilingual population is the individual differences. No two bilinguals are same even within the same socio-cultural background. So, that is again another um, emerging domain that is being looked at. 
So, these are the four uh, of course, it is not exhaustive list, but these are the four main domains where the churn is happening, the newer questions, newer methods are being proposed. Some of these we can look at in detail, some of um, but uh, not all because this is uh, again as I said it is a vast area. So, uh, one of the most important areas of uh, uh, important uh, domains is the questioning the methods itself because methods is what decides how the results will ultimately come out to be. So, as a result a lot of uh, important uh, scholars have uh, voiced their uh, opinion about methods, the kind of methods that we use, one of them is questionnaires. So, not only we have looked at, uh, we have to take a new look at the research questions, newer variables to count for even the questionnaires used to assess the background. Remember when we discussed about the various groups of bilingual population, we start with a questionnaire. Questionnaire is to assess the background, linguistic background of the population. Linguistic background may include uh, the language. Uh, when they learned their respective languages, at what age, the proficiency level and so on and so forth. So, even uh, today we also have questionnaires that could assess the language switching pattern and so on. So, these are the questionnaire part of the experiment. So, after the questionnaires we have collected data from the participants, then the participants go ahead for the experimental part of the work. Now, these questionnaires are very, very crucial because it gives us the background information about the participants and as a result this needs to be taken with utmost care. Now, the multiple authors have started to discuss the variability of questionnaires use. Though there are certain standard questionnaires like LibQ, LHQ and so on, there are few standard questionnaires. However, that notwithstanding that, even then there are lots of different types of questionnaires that are used by different groups of researchers. So, as a result of which that this kind of amount of variability in the questionnaire itself, then this will contribute to the lack of replicability. Lack of replicability is one big issue uh, that we discussed in the uh, within the area of bilingual advantage. Why we do not see the same kind of advantage or disadvantage or null results is because also because of uh, as, as researchers are now pointing out, they are because of questionnaires as well, because questionnaires are vari variable. In a recent paper, the authors have pointed out that even though the questionnaires are variable, the variant, there are different kinds of um, constructs that are, that are overarching. So, all questionnaires basically try to take care of these factors. So, language exposure, use, activities and current language skills, these are the primary questions that all questionnaires uh, address. However, to what extent these questions are operationalized across different questionnaires is where the variation is. These are the questions, but to what extent each of these questions and their sub questions are taken care of in each, each questionnaire is where the variability lies. So, if questionnaires are not uniform, how can we compare the different populations across studies? It is simply not possible because not each questionnaire has taken care of the same crucial question. What could be crucial in one particular community may not be crucial in another community. Similarly, the other way around also is true. Certain things are universally correct, but are we using the same pattern of questionnaire across different populations and across different studies? If, if not, then there will be a lot of variation. So, and this probably also adds to the lack of replicability. So, this is why it is a very crucial question to answer, to, to look at and to find a solution to. And most of these uh, questions are, um, I am quoting only the very recent papers in the last couple of years, 2-3 years let us say, that is these are the questions that have been raised. Hence, there is a need for greater transparency. The authors are now, the researchers, the well known names, well known influential authors are now asking for transparency across studies in terms of creating the questionnaire and using the questionnaire. So, there has to be um, transparency and also a lot of uh, similarity that is that should be there. So, if uh, a group in uh, India let us say are using one particular kind of questionnaire making certain changes, for example, uh, LibQ has now an Indian version, there are some well known names uh, in cognitive sciences in they have they have actually made some changes to for to make it suitable for Indian context. Now, we have to also see if this, this can be replicated in another country. So, we have to be very, very careful about what we incorporate and what we do not and report them in the research findings. That is one. 
keeping these things in mind, there are uh, now and yet another group of uh, influential researchers have now talked about bilingualism as a discovery science. Now, dis what is discovery science? Discovery science is something that you know, uh, in any scientific discipline, you need to, uh, you need to, you cannot really prescribe a set of rules because that that way you are restricting the possibilities of finding out the entire truth. So, one has to be very open. Uh, the method should be open ended. There has to be a baseline, but at the same time, you should be always open for trying out newer methods. And only then you will know, you will discover the entire truth. So, that is basically what discovery science is all about. So, they as a result have proposed a novel way to look at the ever unfolding knowledge on bilingualism as a phenomenon. Every other day, we have a new paper talking about the same phenomena uh, unfolding very differently uh, across populations. So, in order to tap into that, we need to also look at different kinds of methods to look at, to, to arrive at the conclusions. So, because the domain is still capable of throwing surprises, so strict set of methods, sample size, etc., cannot be and should not be prescribed. So, what, how should we go about? They also have given some ideas about uh, what to do rather than what not to do. So, sensitive tasks geared towards ten testing specific processes. One needs to create a very fine tuned set of tasks, what that could be specific for a particular sensitive towards a particular question, sensitive towards a particular setup, sensitive towards a particular set of population, that is what they mean. So, specific processes need specific um, look at the questionnaires or the methods that is used. Similarly, to identify um, a phenotypic variation, there has to be a rich characterization as well. Also, non-binary questions because typically yes, no questions are binary questions. So, you cannot always have a binary question. Sometimes there could be more than two or three possibilities um, of answer for a particular question. So, those things need to be also taken into account. Often there are um, questionnaires as well as methods that have that give us two extreme points of the uh, spectrum. Possibilities uh, that could exploit the midpoints as well need to be taken into account. So, in order to do a create a more viable research environment, now uh, they use, they, now they advocate um, out of box thinking basically, out of box thinking as in creating newer methods of finding the finding answers to the old questions. So, um, many of these replication failures have been a matter of data interpretation choice of participants, confounding variables, there is a possibility also that the sticking to a prescriptive set of methods is a big problem as well. So, this is as you can see, this is this is the paper that talks about this and you, uh, so uh, all the big influential authors are now talking about this uh, as a possibility that we need to go out of the set, need to go out of the prescriptive set. We have not that they are bad. But we have moved uh, ahead in time. So, the prescriptive set of questionnaires and the methods and the uh, data elicitation processes, even data analysis processes probably had their you know uh, time. Now, we need to take a re-look is what they are saying. So, this, this was about the, on the methods side. Now, we are looking at the cognitive function as well. So, um, again going back to the seventh module, we looked at various um, tasks that bilinguals are um, regularly uh, put through there to look at the cognitive functions of a bilingual to find out the advantage or, or disadvantage or the null results in certain cases. Typically, we look at the executive function tasks. So, executive function that includes attention, inhibition, working memory and so on. Now, there are new insights that are coming out from researchers that we need to take a real look as to which aspect within executive function need to be focused. If you remember, we talked about um, the various models, uh, inhibitory control model, adaptive control hypothesis and so, uh, so many other models that look at the primary focus of those models have been the inhibition that is part of executive function. So, inhibition is a very important uh, aspect within executive function that has been connected to how bilinguals perform different tasks. Primarily to because the link is that if you are a bilingual, if you are a, a high proficient bilingual, uh, then you, you are constantly inhibiting your second and uh, the language that is not in use at, at the moment. In that 
in turn strengthens your inhibitory processes which in turn uh, reflects in your other kinds of multitasking capacities. So, how you inhibit the non-relevant um, responses. So, that is what has been the primary um, finding or let us say that has been the mainstay of the argument. Now, there is a uh, change that uh, one of the newer approaches to account for this variance is that uh, bilingual cognitive control has tried to find nuances within this mechanism. Okay. So, it is not the framework is not um, uh, the evidence is not problematic, but the framework with which we look at the evidence is problematic according to this. So, uh, till now as I said that inhibition has been the central focus, but now there is a um, uh, proposal that rather than inhibition we must look at attention control. Uh, attention control and inhibition both are part of executive function, but so far inhibition was getting more attention than attentional control. Now, there has been a proposal for a shift and uh, say that they are saying that attentional control has uh, maybe a better way of um, you know better alternative to inhibition in order to account for the differences in the results that we see. So, uh, it has they have suggested this is a recent paper by uh, Ballistock and Craig. Uh, Ballistock ha has decades of uh, research experience uh, in her um, kitty. So, this is from her group. So, they are now saying that group differences will emerge only when the attentional demands of a task exceed the control abilities of one of the groups. So, the attention control ability of the group is what is more important. So, in the day to day life of the of the group, how much demand is placed on the attention control abilities of that group is what is the deciding factor. That is what they are saying. So, this again takes us to bilingual environment. So, different kind of bilingual environment puts different kinds of demands on the attentional mechanism. This is not very different from the adaptive control hypothesis. Adaptive control hypothesis also says similar things that different bilingual uh, scenarios, different kinds of uh, language switching scenarios puts different levels of demand uh, cognitive load on the bilingual person's uh, inhibitory control. What they are now saying is what Bialystok and her group is now saying is that it is all fine, but the, uh, the effect of the bilingual environment probably has more to do with attentional control rather than with um, inhibitory control uh, in terms of specialized demands. This adaptation uh, as a result confers domain general benefit to attentional control and that is exactly why uh, th this is exactly how they explain the differences in outcome given all other important variables uh, being constant. For example, in lot of studies the, um, that have looked at the weird population, weird as you, if you remember western educated industrialized rich democratic societies basically western societies. So, participants from western societies often show a similar kind of control mechanism in terms of their language control as well as domain general executive control. However, we do not always find that. Uh, one of our own studies have shown that uh, even high proficient bilinguals who have learned two languages from childhood uh, not simultaneous uh, still successive bilingual, but uh, quite comparable proficiency in both the languages and the society also practices dual language um, uh, code mixing scenario. Even then the, there was a difference between domain general and domain specific control mechanisms. So, probably if we look at the attentional control mechanism of the people focusing more on that rather than inhibition probably we might find better answers. So, this is what they also say that so, the resulting benefit enhances aspects of performance across the lifespan. This is also very crucial as we just saw uh, bilingualism through lifespan is becoming a very important and uh, salient uh, uh, variable nowadays. So, this is uh, another domain that has now been. So, in terms of how we look at, so how we look at the function mental mechanism as to which aspect within executive control should be given more uh, under more uh, focus. So, on the one hand we looked at how tasks and questionnaires and all those methodological changes need to be made at the same time we are also now looking at a scenario where the uh, functions mental functions that are being uh, studied can also be also merit a relook. 
Now let us look, uh, look at the consequences. We have also seen that uh, there are consequences of being a bilingual in terms of neural correlates. So, we have different sort of uh, networks created, we have in even in terms of anatomical physiological changes between a bilingual and monolingual, uh, monolingual person's brain and so on. So, there are changes, there are neurological consequences in the cortical and subcortical regions. Now, using an additional language as this kind of uh, scenario. So, basically uh, being a bilingual places increased demand. So, how we have understood, how we have um, uh, looked at this, how we have justified the differences is that uh, bilingualism increases demands on uh, both linguistic and nonverbal executive control and as a result the brain adapts both functionally and structurally. Uh, if you remember, we have looked at higher number of gray matter, how higher amount of gray matter and higher connectivity in the bilingual brain as opposed to monolingual brain. So, this is why it, it happens. So, increased demands uh, on both language and non-linguistic uh, executive function that in turn makes changes in the brain, both functionally and anatomically. Now, uh, these changes are seen in the cortical as well as subcortical uh, domains in terms of gray matter volume, subcortical shape differences, difference in, in diffusi uh, diffusivity uh, patterns and so on. So, all of these we have seen before. However, now there are uh, more, there are finer uh, look at these aspects as well that says that it is not just being a bilingual, but within that also there has to be some layered understanding as to which aspect of bilingualism leads to what kind of uh, functional and anatomical changes in the brain. So, one of them, one st recent study Lee et al suggested that effect of bilingualism on the brain there are variables that need to be looked at uh, even within that. So, there are three variables that he talks about. One is the timing of the acquisition of the second language with respect to the first language and then the L1, L2 interaction. It is not a simple fact of being a bilingual, but we are looking at now the nuances within bilingualism itself. And then the second point he talks about is the nature of L2 input, how the L2 input was given, whether it was um, you know the intensity or whether uh, it was as complex as the L1 or you no know, many other variables have also been talked about. So, intensity of something as complex as L2 learning and so on. And then the extent of L2 input in terms of the amount of experiences and opportunities for using an L2. So, see uh, whether it is con uh, questionnaire or method or every uh, or uh, you know, looking at the executive function till the brain everybody is now all, all the researchers in various domains across uh, uh, countries are now looking at the amount the experience factor of the bilingual. So, it is not simply to say that, uh, that this is a bilingual community. However, the experience of being a bilingual which is not a simple thing at all experience can range from the kind of the language distance between distance between L1 and L2 linguistically, culturally and so many others. So, this again in terms of brain uh, changes also uh, neuronal changes as well experience seems to be a very important pointer. This is what Lee and his group uh, suggests. So, how the language is used, how many, what kind of opportunities of using the L2 are there and so on. So, these are certain factors within the uh, neuroanatomy of bilingualism as well. Another uh, connected domain uh, which is the um, biliteracy is also becoming quite uh, uh, prominent these days. This is not again it is also not entirely new however, a lot of activities have been uh, reported in the literature now in this domain. So, biliteracy is um, connected to bilingualism but slightly different. When we talked about bilingualism if you recall in the very beginning we this uh, how did we define bilingualism. For the benefit of the course for keeping things simple we agreed to use a definition like a bilingual is a person who can speak and understand two languages and who has the opportunity to use both languages in his day to day life that is what bilingualism is all about. So, this means that the largely the focus has been on speaking and understanding 
and even in uh, while discussing the various processes bilingual language processing we also again we focused on the hearing and speaking aspect of bilingualism and less focus was on reading and writing we did talk about it a little but not as much as bilingual language processing so that is what we is talking about that is what we mean by biliteracy biliteracy is uh, taking things a little further and taking it to the domain of reading and writing so bilingual you, you speak and understand at the same time you can read and write in both the languages now these are not um, one does not entail the other biliterate person is more often than not is a bilingual but a being a bilingual does not entail automatically biliteracy for example a lot of people in indian scenario it is even more understandable more readily relatable uh, in india it is very common to find people who are not literate who are not educated who have never, never been to school uh, but they can speak more than uh, one language bilingual multilingual trilingual you find them then are biliterate however most of us uh, uh, in the educated uh, domain of the society biliteracy is also common so these are two different but closely connected areas so a biliterate is somebody who is considered proficient in communicating in reading and writing as well so proficient in communicating in two languages in uh, the, through reading and writing so this is often understood as an advanced state of bilingualism so you not only speak but you also add two more skills to your existing kit so they can they this idea has been around for quite some time however as you can see that 1983 also people were talking about them but today the Uh, more and more experimental research is happening in these domains we have discussed some of these in the uh, last module now th there are many nuances there are many variables within this domain as well because be becoming bilingual uh, biliterate requires to uh, develop a skill in engaging and making sense of the texts in two languages now these texts can be different just as languages can be different in terms of linguistic distance cultural distance when you talk about text there are other further nuances one is the script scripts can be different so with a bilingual who is speaking in english and chinese for example the scripts are very very different so that also will be added variable to look at when you talk about biliteracy so developing word level and text level skills in two language involves a common set of processes that may transfer across languages so transfer we have already uh, discussed before the transfer happens in case of bilinguals from one language to another it can be l1 to l2 or l2 to l1 similar transfer is possible in case of writing as well now um, this is what uh, we just talked about so transfer of literacy skills like reading and writing strategies this happens uh, this is this takes place in case of a biliterate person now the effect of biliteracy have largely examined cross linguistic transfer in terms of reading and writing uh, but even within this uh, reading has gotten more attention than writing writing uh, as a um, bi bilingual writing that is our writing of bilinguals has is a recent phenomena that is recent phenomena in terms of uh, experimental work that is being now looked at so the types and conditions of skill transfer between two languages while writing is something that has been now uh, being that is now being looked at while discussing this we probably need to go back to a uh, uh, rather old but still many of his ideas still hold today uh, which is called linguistic interdependence uh, principle by cummins 1991 very influential work uh, he talked about literacy transfer in two conditions so when do literacy transfer happen so you see the ideas have been around um, for a, for quite some time not entirely new so there are uh, two things that he primarily focuses on that uh, you need to have high level of literacy in one language at that time in 1991 dominant language was considered to be the first language as well so first language mother tongue more dominant language they all were the same things but today things have changed we know now that uh, your most dominant language need not be your l1 which is true for many of us the language we started our life with is hardly used any more today so because of the ch changed uh, scenario we find ourselves within in any case the depending on the high level of proficiency in one language will decide which way the uh, 
uh, transfer will happen. So, transfer is basically uh, skill transfer. He talks about skill transfer between languages. So, it happens from the more dominant to the less dominant language. In his time, it was the L1, but today it is also L2. That is one. So, more dominant language typically or the language in which your proficiency is higher typically will decide the skill transfer direction. That is one. Secondly, also this transfer will depend on the language distance. Uh, we, saw, we saw that language distance and cultural distance play a very important role in language processing. Similarly, this also plays a role in writing uh, in case of writing and uh, skill transfer in writing systems. So, if the orthographies are similar, like writing systems are similar, for example, Devanagari is used uh, in many languages in, in, in our country, uh, even in languages that are not Indo-Aryan. So, Devanagari is the script is same. However, if there are differences in the script, there will be different kinds of, uh, this will also create a nuanced uh, outcome in case of skill transfer. So, I give the example of Chinese and English. Similarly, you can have different kinds of things. For English and Spanish, both are alphabetic system. However, many other languages are not. So, Chinese is not, for example. So, these are uh, certain domains of um, research that is now coming up following Cummins uh, influential work in 91. Today, all today, we are looking at the same issues in a slightly more nuanced way, but um, uh, in terms of bilingual writing, how, how things uh, change. Now, let us move on to bilingual education. Bilingual education has become, um, again it is not entirely new, it has been around for some time, but now it is uh, more common. It is now found in many countries in the world uh, owing to a number of large uh, migrations across countries and uh, this, has, this has now uh, become a necessity. So, uh, bilingual education is what is bilingual education? This is when any education program is taught or learnt in two or more languages, right? So, to teach non language related academic subject matters. So, for example, if there is a school that teaches the subjects in both uh, English and Hindi, let us say. So, some, some classes are taken in English, some classes are taken in Hindi on the same subject. So, geography can be taught through English, geography can be taught through Hindi that is called a bilingual education system. So, often in such scenarios where language of instruction and the language of the home community do not match is when we say this. Bilingual education has been around in the US for a very long time. And this, this education system primarily targeted the uh, bilinguals. If you remember, if you go back, uh, recall in the initial parts of the course, where we talked about that bilingualism was considered a stigma because typically those people will be found to be bilingual who were um, not in the same strata of the society, they were in disadvantaged in many ways, who were migrants and so on. So, though for the benefit of those people, for example, lots of Mexican and Hispanic people are there in the US for whom the language of home is Spanish or Portuguese, but the language of education is English. Now, this as a result creates a problem in the, for the students, they often do not cope up as a result of which to tackle this problem bilingual education came up and now there are a number of schools in the US that teaches the subjects both in their home language as well as in their uh, in the official language which is English. So, gradually the so as the focus here is that the students should not lose out on uh, learning the subjects just because the language is uh, unfamiliar, language is not there, the, their proficiency in the L2 is not so good. Something similar has been uh, is now getting incorporated in Indian system as well with a new education policy. This, this is uh, uh, something that we will be incorporating very soon. So, this will help uh, alleviate the marginalized groups more than anybody else. So, since the end of the 20th century, lots of developments have taken place in the bilingual education model. So, these are the uh, several models that have been around for some time now. One is called the enrichment bilingual education, transitional bilingual education, two-way immersion and heritage uh, bilingual education and so on because this is as I said it is not a very new field. It has been uh, changing and it has been evolving over a period of time. So, we have various methods of uh, imparting bilingual education to the uh, various levels of education uh, within school system even college some, some places. So, the enrichment bilingual education this is most commonly found in the French immersion programs. 
uh, in Canada. Uh, we have talked about Canadian scenario before as well. So, there are French areas and then there are English areas. So, uh, French immersion programs are very popular and very common there. And it is also found in the European international schools and other examples are of course there in um, include Spain with the Basque or the Catalan languages, UK with Welsh, USA with Spanish as I had just mentioned. So, these are the same different domains, the different places and different uh, language systems, uh, lang uh, education systems that use the um, different kinds of enrichment bilingual education. So, what is the aim of such programs? The aim of such programs is to promote biliteracy through the use of a second language as a medium of education. So, the, the idea is not only to um, uh, give them education in the, about subjects beyond languages in two language, but at the same time to promote biliteracy so that they grow up learning to read and write in both the languages, the official language as well as their mother tongue. So, the purpose is to enable speakers of minority languages to develop skills in the majority language while maintaining their home language. So, they do not have to compromise on their home language. In fact, this has been used in uh, USA as well, not only with Spanish, but also with Ebonics. There were schools that uh, particularly catered to African American uh, students whose home language was Ebonics and the official language in the school was English. And uh, at part a period of time, they used both Ebonics and English, Standard English uh, for education. The idea was in that case, the idea was to help them gradually move from Ebonics to Standard um, American English. So, these are the various purposes and various um, uh, models for uh, which all come under enrichment bilingual education. Then there is this um, trans, uh, transitional bilingual education, the focus is uh, on the use of home uh, minority language earlier education settings with the aim of shifting to the dominant language gradually. So, you start with Spanish, gradually you can move to entirely, you entirely English dominated language. So, this has been there. Then two way immersion is also another model. So, according to this model, the students of the majority language that is the native English speakers and students speaking the minority language, uh, let us say Spanish are integrated and provided with content instruction and language development in both languages. This is something uh, that is a, a comparatively newer development where you see not only you target the minority language um, uh, speakers, the language the, those people who speak a different language at home as opposed to the language in school. This the, here both groups are uh, given uh, adequate training in order to uh, understand both the languages. This also started uh, pretty early, but uh, now it is quite common. So, mid 80s uh, towards due to the growing popularity of foreign language learning among the English speakers. There are similarly other models as well, uh, heritage uh, bilingual education. This has been um, associated with education through indigenous language like aboriginal languages for example in Australia. This is po quite popular in um, Australia, New Zealand and so on. So, heritage bilingual education, heritage languages, indigenous languages are used. So, till now the other models that we saw were also were not uh, indigenous languages so to say. They were well established uh, language in mainstream language to some extent in other countries, but in that country in US for example, Spanish is a minority language in the US, but not in Spain. However, when you talk about aboriginal language, aboriginal languages are those languages, those groups that are minority even within their own country, for example, in Australia aboriginal languages in Australia. Hence, heritage bilingual education is a completely different thing than compared to the uh, other ones. So, various educational approaches have uh, resulted in a range of bilingual models like this content based instruction, language across curriculum and so on. There are many of these uh, things every other commonly quite uh, within very short span of time we have added lots of new models into this and this is the latest that we have um, we could curate for you uh, from a 19. 2021 uh, publication. Another connected development has been uh, in terms of heritage language speakers, in terms of focusing research on heritage language speakers. So, heritage languages are 
minority languages in a society and are typically learned at home during childhood. Now, heritage languages uh, in today's terms, heritage languages are not only the indigenous uh, or as we call them tribal languages in India, but also those languages that are uh, not minority in their own place, but in a different place they are heritage language. So, for example, uh, Ao Naga is spoken in Guwahati will be considered a heritage language. So, this is used only at home and this is a minority in the current socio-cultural scenario. So, the field of heritage language acquisition has emerged um, over the past two decades uh, while we discussed, while we uh, investigated bilingual language scenario. Remember, we talked about um, in the bilingual language processing uh, module, we looked at how heritage language speakers uh, data differ significantly from the other groups. So, the heritage speakers are typically not trained literate readers of their heritage language since for many heritage speakers the language is imparted and used exclusively orally which is the case for many uh, smaller groups. Many in many parts of the country uh, within Indian scenario or across the world many heritage languages still today are not written. So, they are uh, still in the oral tradition. So, that automatically makes them a very separate uh, group to look at. And even in scenarios where heritage language and the majority language share the same script, which is the case many cases in India where heritage languages are written in Devanagari script or uh, you know Manipuri written in Bangla script for example. So, this also has happened. So, even in that case um, overlap in phoneme to graphing correspondence are also there. Chances are still that the heritage language speakers may be slower in reading the heritage language. In fact, there are further nuances to it. For example, when we write uh, an indigenous language which does not have a script of its own and we use another language script for example, using uh, Bangla for writing Boro for example, there are inherent problems there. One problem is the, the diacritics, the, the, the sounds that do not exist in the Bangla script that are not represented in the Bangla script, how to take care of those in Boro while writing in Boro or tonal languages, any other tonal language for that matter, right. So, so there are further nuances. So, heritage speakers experience on a continuum reduced quantities of input as well as context in which they are likely to hear or use the heritage language. That is another important domain. What do we mean by this is that even though heritage language speakers are keeping the language alive, they use it at home, uh, at home or within the society itself, the domains of usage of the heritage language is often compared to the main language compared to the major language quite smaller. So, academic discourse for example, does not happen in a heritage language, political discourse may or may not. Certain nuances in science, education, technology and uh, you know judiciary, these, these are the domains where heritage language cannot be used. As a result, what happens when you, when you are comparing heritage language with the majority language, there are significant differences. So, even though they are bilinguals and high proficient bilinguals, there are still certain differences that cannot be ignored. So, that is why heritage language uh, speakers have come into the, have come under uh, focus in a, in a major way uh, today. One of the papers that one of the recent publications that talks about is this and the paper actually uh, talks more about this one can go and read the paper itself, but we just made some of the major points. Now, after taking care of taking care of all of these various, is, various uh, issues within bilingualism itself, we are till now talking only about the normal typical population whether it is adult or children. Uh, we need to you know, we need to have a re-look in terms of methods and uh, analyzing the data, choosing the participants and the variables and so on. We are still sticking to the typical population. Now, changes have happened in the atypical population as well, studying atypical population as well. So, some of these studies we will just uh, will talk about. Now, bilingualism has an impact on typical population that has already been studied and uh, some amount of advantage is reported. Most of these advantages are non-critical as in they are non-controversial let us say in case of children. So, children uh, bilingual advantage among children is more uh, solidly supported than uh, the other age groups. So, taking that forward researchers are now looking at if 
The similar kind of advantages of bilingualism can be found on atypical population as well. Atypical population is that population, that group of people that are uh, that have some amount of disorder in either linguistic disorder or cognitive or developmental disorder. So, they are called atypical uh, children. So, atypical children may have developmental disorders that affects language as well as executive function mechanism. So, those are the people that researchers are now looking at if there is there can be an advantage or if bilingualism could be an alleviating factor in uh, minimizing in some of the uh, problems. So, some such domains include stuttering, autism spectrum disorder, language disorder and so on. We will start with stuttering. Stuttering is uh, not very uncommon, it is not exactly a disorder per se, but it is a disturbance in speech let us say. So, uh, the recent studies have looked at the correlation between bilingualism and stuttering or specifically the neurology of stuttering. Now, increased gray matter in uh, uh, Broca's area in bilinguals, this is already established, we already have seen that uh, in bilingual brain the, there, there is an increase of gray matter in the Broca's area. Now, they are now looking at researchers are now looking at if uh, this has an effect to decrease the effect of stutter. So, does higher amount because stuttering has to do with the motor control of speech. Right? So, there is a lack of motor control on of speech. Now, we also know that Broca's area controls the articulation in human speech. So, if there is higher amount of gray matter in the Broca's area, could it be correlated to or could it have let us say um, some amount of advantageous effect on stuttering is what the research question now is. Now, bilingualism affects individuals who stutter in both positively and negatively that is what the findings suggest. Bilingualism can positively affect neurology in terms of phonological awareness and executive functioning of individuals who stutter. Right. So, uh, based on their culture languages they are switching between and the languages spoken. So, these are the domains in which some amount of impact has been found out uh, in case of bilinguals because bilingualism um, bilingualism has any positive impact in, in terms of brain, in terms of high, higher amount of gray matter, these have been found to have positive effect on neurology and also in terms of language, in terms of phonological awareness, executive function and so on. However, this is not uh, without negative impact as well, bilingualism can have negative impact on individuals uh, with stuttering um, because this causes an experience, this, uh, this causes an individual to experience cognitive overload. So, uh, bilingualism uh, speaking two languages also adds to the load, cognitive load and individual experiences at any given point of time. Now, when you when a person is suffering from stuttering, a added cognitive load sometimes have been found to actually increase the problem, right. And also when they have to switch between languages, this, this causes an extra effort, extra problem in terms of switching language. So, this the research in this area is still in its infancy, only few studies have uh, taken place so far. Uh, some of these are, are very recent studies and but uh, there has there seems to be some correlation. Uh, correlation between bilingualism and stuttering both in positive and negative way. We have to wait and see how uh, this, this area moves ahead. In terms of autism spectrum disorder, ASD is autism spectrum disorder. Now, we already know that children suffering from ASD, they ex exhibit significant deficiency in terms of executive function. This is uh, already established that children suffering from ASD suffer in terms of EF as well as language language in terms of both comprehension and production. There are changes, the ASD is a actually a spectrum, there are high functioning ASD as well as low functioning ASD, but typically the population has a problem with executive function as well as language. Now, now on the one hand, um, so there are, this, there are these problems, but on the other hand bilingualism is also found to enhance the same function in normal population. Right. So, keeping this in mind, now researchers are looking at the if the high functioning autistic children, this will not be possible with children who are very, very low functioning. Low functioning autistic children are those children who have very, very less um, command over language, they have almost no language at all 
and they also have very severe problem with executive function. So there it is very difficult to check the bilingualism effect of bilingualism on their executive function. However, some studies have looked at high functioning bilinguals who uh, are bilingual autistic children who speak who speak two languages and they have tried to see if there is a correlation between the linguistic competence of those kids on the and the um, other kind of executive control mechanisms typically using card sorting task and other tasks that we have already seen before. So, the uh, one recent study has um, reported that bilingual advantage among uh, school age children with ASD. Uh, in some lab based tasks and they have found some amount of uh, positive correlation uh, in the uh, only in terms of the high proficient and the bilingual the speaking mm. ASD children. Similarly, there are um, other studies uh, recent studies that talks about is, uh, um, issues uh, obstructing successful identification and uh, diagnosis of developmental language disorders in bilingual children. This is an ever evolving domain. Uh, and um, this is a separate domain altogether, the identification and diagnosis and um, uh, the recovery pattern and the various kinds of uh, tools that can be used for, um, uh, for improving the conditions. This is, this is a very different domain. However, there are some things that are relatable to bilingualism. So, one of the issues is of course, successful identification and diagnosis. So, a lack of norm reference text is a big problem for bilingual children within the language disorder, population of language disorder, uh, children with language disorder. Secondly, absence of a common framework of assessment because most of these frameworks or most of these questionnaires or uh, texts or tests, uh, test batteries and so on are not really created for bilingual children. They are more often than not created for monolingual children, keeping, keeping in mind monolingual uh, atypical children uh, into account. However, there is no bilingual specific uh, assessment tool. So, that is one area and uh, speech language pathologists have difficulty in identifying language disorders in the first place when they do not have proper training. That is another problem that has been repeatedly been uh, voiced by researchers. So, in this case keeping all this in mind because on the one hand we see that there are some uh, researchers uh, who are working on these areas connecting bilingualism to various kinds of language disorders and on the other hand we have uh, a severe lack of uh, not only test batteries and tasks but also uh, well trained personnel. The keeping all of these things in mind there are these suggestions that uh, are now coming up in to, to tackle this problem. One is the dynamic assessment, so not sticking to the prescribed set of assessment tools and non-word word repetition is a very common task used for assessing language disorder in children. So, this is now there have been there are suggestions that non-word repetitions could also be utilized, then language sampling, parent report, etc. Some principles of assessing bilingual children are these, there are new suggestions. So, Bilingual and non-bilingual children should not be assessed in the same manner, right now they are assessed in the same way and also keeping in mind the individual differences because most of it is not only about bilingual, it is not only about atypical children but in all the research that we have looked at till now there is a certain set of rules, certain set of tasks that are used for everybody. And now there is a re-look at that and similarly the re-look has been suggested for atypical children as well. So, norm reference and alternate measures of assessment and so on. Language disorder or language difference, there are all kinds of new uh, ideas that are being proposed now. So, this is where we will uh, conclude the part 1. In the, in the next part, we will look at other issues that have come up recently within these uh, new trends of bilingualism research as well as we will move on to multilingualism, third language acquisition. Uh, we will talk about some new model that have come up as well as uh, we will look at other related issues. Okay. Mm -hmm.